I wish they hadn't done that. They took the bus down for us. Most of the time, everything goes very well. And, uh, but then there are those moments where suddenly, uh, uh, and very unexpectedly, you're in a situation where uh, your performance has ultimate consequences. Not a good sign. It's at 11.50. We think the engine will go down in four minutes. Looks like it'll run till six minutes, Captain. Discovery update on the engine. We think it'll run to six minutes. I like to listen to the tapes of the missions and of the teams because after you've done it for a while, it's like music. And when a good team is working with a good flight director, it is like beautiful music. Did you finish the extra? My name is Eileen Collins, and I'm an Air Force Lieutenant Colonel. I'm currently training to fly on STS-63, which is a space shuttle flight scheduled for February of 1995. We've never had a woman fly in the right seat of the space shuttle as a space shuttle pilot. Well, as a shuttle pilot, we need to keep up our proficiency in between uh, shuttle flights and before our first shuttle flight. Predominantly, we fly the T-38. We fly about, oh, 10 times a month. I'm keeping your hands on the stick and throttles. When I first decided I wanted to be an astronaut, it was such a far off, wild dream. I was, I was embarrassed to tell anybody that I wanted to do it. Um, of course, back then, as a youngster, uh, there were only men astronauts. After this pattern, we'll be requesting departure to the local area. I want three, Roger. Whenever we say we want some astronauts, we get hundreds and hundreds, even thousands of applicants. Uh, it's easy to go fishing in a, in a pool that's this deep, you know. We pick 20 or 25 every couple of years, uh, our superb individuals. Maverick isn't exactly what you want, and you don't want a uh, computer nerd or something. You don't want somebody that's very, very good in just one subject and, and not uh, broad. So what we look for is somebody who is, of course, intelligent and willing to work hard and, in fact, subvert their own desires for somebody else's, because in many cases you carry somebody else's science up into orbit and do their work. Uh, somebody who, who can get along in a team situation and behave pretty well in an emergency. In airplanes, the convenient thing is, though, you can put an instructor pilot in with a pilot and you can go putzing around the countryside and learn how to do things. Uh, space flight is still so expensive, you can't do that. You can't send a rookie into orbit because of the time and the expense. So um, we try to recreate the environment on the ground. Now, when we do the simulator training, we have an astronaut crew in the actual simulator itself. We have a training crew, which is, which is down at the console, and they have a script that they have written ahead of time on a list of malfunctions that they're going to input into the simulator. And then we have flight controllers over in mission control, and they don't know what kind of malfunctions are coming. And the astronaut crew doesn't know what's coming. Okay, we're in flight control room one. We're about to start an integrated simulation. We're about to launch Discovery. Copy and lift off. Oh, Roger roll, discovery. So what you do is you, you launch and you immediately start getting malfunctions. And what the pilot needs to do, and the commander and the mission specialist, is identify what is wrong. And that's that's difficult. Captain Leak's going in. Left engine helium leak. Holler when you're out of the procedure. Mr. we see a leak on the left engine helium. Go for the procedure. In training, they pound on us incessantly, 
but after a while, you even get used to an environment where there are uh, uh, 20 or 30 malfunctions an hour coming at you, and you get used to it. If Discovery Houston managing limits inhibit, stuck in the bucket. You cannot simulate that pressure, and the way we make up for it in training is to put in a large number of problems, which leads to the same kind of feelings of pressure that you get on a real flight day when maybe one thing is not working exactly right. We're on one IMU right now. See, it pulls out. Yeah. It's starting to clean up a little now. It's not looking too bad. Now they survived at this more or less, let them land. Crews come back laughing. They say if you can survive the simulators, the space flight itself is a dream. <laughs> Trying to keep up with the vehicle that's going about Mach 25, and our brains are only about Mach 23, so we're scrambling. Oh, it's, it's better than a workout at the gym. <laughs> My name is Al Strainer. Um, I'm a site test conductor with the Space Shuttle Endeavor and second generation space worker. Her job is uh, getting her ready and uh, space flight worthy from the orbiter processing facility. If you owned a recreational vehicle, and you were going to take it on a very long trip. Before you did that, you would probably put it in a garage, and you would ask the mechanics to check everything. When you put the space shuttle, the orbiter, in the orbiter processing facility, the OPF, you do just that. and uh, we look at it very close. We're less than six inches in a lot of places. We've got it spotted in here, and it's less than eight hours from being in space. We're back here in the OPF. Uh, there are thousands upon thousands of individual tiles on the space shuttle. We inspect every one of those. The um, tires, the main gear, come off. The brakes are, they come off and are refurbished and, and uh, re-inspected, reinstalled. Every landing when the bird comes in, we check for meteor strikes, scratches that may occur, the end of your hair, if you looked at it, that's the size that we look for on the window. And you have to locate every one. We inspect it, and then the technicians come in and clean it behind us so the astronauts can see for the next mission. One window, an inspection will take about two to three days. Polishing would take two shifts. You have to scrub on them eight hours. If there's a certain amount of damage within a, a specified area on the window, they have to pull it out or send it back to pointing. When you get into the payload bay area where we have the cargo, you're getting into a clean room environment. We have um, bunny suits, which are a, uh, an ensemble to stop hair or any type of uh, contamination from the humans from getting into the machine. Like a hair in zero G can affect an astronaut's breathing. Uh, inside the crew, crew module, the radios are checked, the uh, navigating radar is checked, the, all the communications panels, the uh, computers run through a series of checks. So all of those systems get a check out. And I think you have to realize that when the shuttle was built in the late 70s, uh, computer power uh, was not very readily available, so that now the shuttle is outshone by your PC that sits at your house. Uh, in fact, each of the five flight computers only has 256K of memory. Probably have more uh, compute power under the hood of your car. In order to sell the shuttle to Congress, NASA kept downsizing it to a more and more modest vehicle and a vehicle that could increasingly use existing technology. In the early 70s, the shuttle was designed to satisfy not just NASA's missions of civil space, but it was designed to handle all the military payloads, and it was designed to handle all the commercial payloads. 
That's putting all the eggs in one basket.